I, I used to be afraid of uh, production outages, uh, and I suspect <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, people out there who still are a little bit scared of production outages. I took them uh, personally. I thought they were somehow uh, my fault uh, <clears throat> were as when I was responsible for the software. And but once I understood uh, the concept of observability and uh, and how to properly handle uh, incidents um, and how to understand the no. and how um, understanding yes, the um, internal states of an application, uh, I can better understand uh, the systems. I learned that a lot of my fear was mostly due to um, lack of knowledge, and and so basically once I was able to shine a light on this uh, thing that I started to fear, I started to become more confident and. Uh, by extension, my uh, team started to get more confident, and uh, I think we we had a uh, um, r remarkable uh, transition o over time. And so, I want to share my journey with how I did that. And uh, when I first presented the pitch, the talk, I used the term observability in a much broad sense. But I think uh, some of you might um, recognize this more as SRE or just like incident management or observability plus something also uh, just wanted to be upfront about that. Um, so um, um, th thank you, Heather, for introducing me. And uh, um, I, um, yeah, like I, I used to work at uh, Tesla and uh, SolarCity and Moody's and a bunch of other companies. I, I have about 17 years of experience in the industry. Um, I still remember like one of my early jobs. Uh, I had a pager in Chicago and we had a in-house uh, escalation system and uh, I would get paged at uh, 1 a.m. and I would just barely out of bed I would go and open the computer and then the system would like self-close itself but after it has woken people up so we have come a long way since then but uh, but there's still a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot, 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 lot of exciting things happening in the observability space right now um, and uh, this is one of my passion, but in general, I really um, enjoy just like uh, <clears throat> uh, understanding uh, where teams are at and helping them uh, get get better. Um, I have uh, I've ramped up teams from scratch. I've taken on teams from others and then um, made changes and uh, made them better. So uh, there are different ways to do it. Um, so this talk is going to be primarily based on my uh, experience at Tesla. I had uh, the incredible opportunity to work across uh, three different uh, business verticals. Um, the the vehicle business, which uh, is what most people are familiar with. Um, and since I came from uh, SolarCity, I continue to manage the the energy uh, customer experience uh, software. And, and then the third vertical was what uh, was internally called as uh, SHOP. Uh, which was basically the business that sold vehicle accessories and uh, um, merchandise, and um, <clears throat> and so on the vehicle uh, side, uh, my teams were responsible for uh, what we called as oh, owner experience, crazy. where uh, we uh, supported uh, software or we maintained software that customers would use for doing things like uh, servicing uh, their vehicle, um, referring their uh, friends and family and getting referral bonus and uh, purchasing software upgrades and there's like a whole uh, um, suite of features that they could access and uh, then yeah, the, the energy and uh, shop experience I mentioned those and we worked on both the uh, different parts of the mobile app and also the, the website so it was like a very um, it, it gave me an opportunity to see things that um, across three different uh, business verticals but uh, also see the uh, similarities between them from a software standpoint, <clears throat> and but unfortunately, like you know, 2020 was a uh, landmark year for uh, humanity, and uh, for us, uh, for me specifically, it was like one of the 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 learning moments was like you know when we had three outages uh, around uh, June uh, July timeframe, uh, they were all like a few weeks uh, spread, spread apart. And they all had like completely different uh, reasons, but uh, they all happened uh, for each of my uh, teams. Uh, so on vehicle uh, um, side, uh, there was a DNS change that was made um, 
to one of our uh, ingresses and that basically um, made the vehicle service feature not available for customers, but it was available for people who were on the network. And uh, and then this took uh, way longer than what we wanted to, and it was frankly um, very embarrassing. Uh, then on the energy side, we had uh, we had been working on like a new ordering um, experience, and it had been in the works for a uh, um, couple of months. And, and then we were all like excited to launch it. And uh, the the ordering page is pretty data intensive uh, because we have to show a lot of numbers around uh, um, the the energy production savings and a uh, lot of that. And so there was. Um, some new caching mechanism that the team had built and the team hadn't quite uh, fully understood the, how uh, it was going to play out in production and uh, because uh, the the same infrastructure wasn't there in in the lower environment we it basically ended up backfiring and it, it took a long time for us to really uh, diagnose those issues and uh, with when uh, sharp uh, we launched uh, those of uh, those whimsical uh, product called chart charts that was launched and that uh, Elon uh, tweeted a link to it, and that basically crashed uh, the, the 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 website. Um, and I, here's the the, the tweet uh, that, that he sent out. And he his first tweet was at 3:01 uh, uh, p.m. And I believe this is in uh, Central Time. And the the website crashed at 3:04. Uh, I have seen. Uh, DDoS attack traffic, and this one was nothing like that. Uh, it it was basically like a, it wasn't even a hockey stick. It was like a L L shaped uh, traffic uh, where it just just like spiked instantly. Um, <clears throat> that so was uh, like you know not a good reason why uh, that the website um, should have uh, gone down. But we um, thankfully like I had a very um, like I had a good uh, relationship with my manager and like you know we we all like understood like what was going on but I I took this like really seriously and uh, I wanted to make sure that we uh, this this does not not only does it not happen again and that we uh, come out uh, we this becomes our strength uh, very quickly so and I realized like you know because we so I wanted to give a picture of like, you know, before and after, and uh, this picture is of before is a bit of an approximation across all the teams and across uh, like over time. Uh, but where basically there was like a culture of uh, fear, where culture fear of change, uh, teams were hesitant to push changes uh, more frequently because they were afraid they could break things. Um, and, and so, um, and when things inevitably broke, a lot of the production outages were um, um, they were not diagnosed very clearly. Like we didn't really know why something broke, and uh, as long as it was fixed, uh, people would just like move on to the next thing. And there was some um, we we had log monitoring and uh, alerts and uh, a lot of the basic things there, but most of the alerts were ignored. Uh, alerts were just like set up without uh, like any real thought as like you know okay what. What is the frequency? And uh, like I'll talk about some of those things, but uh, they were a bit haphazard. And but to me, the most important thing was like you know whenever things went wrong, the the first piece of information came from outside the team. So it was before like somebody had to tell the team that hey something is not working. Can you look at it? And then the response would initiate. Uh, they were very few times where the teams would find out, okay, wait, something is off. Uh, we are going to start uh, looking into this. And the team is ahead of uh, uh, the, the rest of them. And um, lastly, like, you know, to answer like a very basic question, are we up in production? Are we, is, is, are we down or is, is something wrong in production was like a very difficult uh, question for uh, teams to answer. And because teams are just like used to doing uh, what we would call as like smoke tests. Uh, does just like load up the website and do like a basic uh, operations here and there, and maybe even do it in a few devices uh, on and off uh, the VPN. And if that looked good, then we called it good. Uh, there wasn't a um, aggregate level uh, monitoring to, to a level that would give us uh, confidence uh, to say, yes, we are up or uh, we something is wrong. So this i felt like this uh, had to be changed and uh, we i um 
I, I realized that you know, this had to be done in like three, tackled in three different buckets. Um, people investing in our people and uh, making sure that we gave them the support and uh, the training that's needed to uh, <clears throat> for, for them to uh, uh, be on call and and realize like you know this is this is huge responsibility. And then the, uh, the, the there is the, the process piece of like you know establishing the feedback loops and making sure that we are learning whenever things go wrong we um, learn from it and make our systems uh, better and more resilient and then the infrastructure piece which is where like you know okay what are we um, what uh, tools are we using and how are we using them and are are we making sure that we have uh, the, uh, the, the the right tools in place <clears throat> and i kind of gave this here as like you know first second and third but i think we we kind of went in there wasn't any particular order here So um, I think uh, they, there are a lot of initiatives that I've worked on um, as a engineering manager and uh, like things like security, reliability, quality. And uh, the, the last one that I'd worked on uh, was like accessibility. And for each one of those uh, ITIs, uh, some people call them architecture characteristics, uh, non-functional requirement, whatever they are, um, the at least like my first uh, mindset or thought process is, okay, let's go find a tool or something that uh, kind of, that embodies the best practices that needs to be done. And that will analyze our source code or our application. And that just like, we'll spit out a checklist of go do these things. And then it'll, it'll give us a stamp of, okay, now you have, uh, um, your code is secure or your code is reliable, so on and so forth. And of course, it never works that way. Um, and once we start using the tools, we realize that, wait, actually, how do we use this tool? Like, you know, why is this feature here? Why is that feature there? And we, it, it becomes obvious that um, it's it, it has to start with uh, um, people's knowledge and culture uh, that we have to understand what is at stake and why are we doing this? And and then we can use the tools to um, do what we want to do. And so observability was no different. Um, we had a lot of the tools in place, and it just like people didn't know the value of uh, understanding the, the the internal states of the system and what what being on call meant. And and so at least you know we need to uh, start with the people. <clears throat> and so the first. Uh, thing we did was just like establish a baseline of what are the business transactions that each team is responsible for. Uh, in some teams, it's, it was like very obvious. It was like a two minute conversation and everybody would uh, just like list the transactions and then we can move on. And in some teams, uh, especially teams that might have inherited uh, the area uh, from someone else and they not everyone knows what it is or it's a, like a large area, it, it took a while for us like list out, okay, these are, it's not just, uh, these are the obvious ones, but then we sometimes get called for these other things and we are not actually sure what they are. So we wanted to first like shine um, a light on like what are our responsibilities here from a business standpoint. And and then that allows us to like uh, establish uh, SLAs on, okay, for these the transactions, like, you know, we do we have an SLA established? If not, let's uh, l uh, establish an SLA and, uh, and then it it allows us to uh, do a lot of the uh, like rest of the the process around these business transactions, where we can build uh, dashboards around business transactions, alerts around uh, the business transactions, and uh, it also gives us like a very standard vocabulary to use uh, across uh, with with business stakeholders and with other teams. Uh, so that like you know one team is not calling something an ordering process the other team is calling it a purchasing process and uh, and then there is just like miscommunication on uh, what exactly we're talking about so uh, so the next was once we did this uh, we did um, some threat modeling and I'll admit like when we did it we didn't call it threat modeling we just I, I don't I don't think we even had a name and even the word threat modeling I'm borrowing it from uh, the world of like you know, if you're uh, for, from security, but I think it still applies here, where for each business transaction we identified uh, what are the software components that are uh, that need to be up and running for us to provide this business uh, 
um, transaction or service. And once we'd identified those uh, software transactions, we would uh, we classified them as like, you know, which ones are critical, which ones are like non-critical. Non-critical would be ones that um, even if they it's it's used for this transaction, but even if they're not, even if it's not running, uh, we can still provide the transaction. It'll basically go into a degraded mode. So, and here there was a uh, offshoot exercise where we had to re-architect uh, some of the business transactions that um, so that we had fewer uh, critical components and uh, and then um, then. Yeah, just basically reduce the critical components to as uh, little as possible. Like for example, we found that uh, our maps uh, integration was actually a critical component in across all the business lines, and it was like very um, it would it can bring down all the systems. And so we had to we did some work to like make it non-critical, um, but that was not uh, part of this observability exercise. Um, and then we created a uh, on-call handbook. Um, on-call engineers uh, were basically had like no uh, recourse. Like, you know, somebody would join a team, and if they had a on-call uh, schedule, they would just get get added on it. And some teams didn't even have the on-call schedules. And uh, even if people are like on-call schedule, they didn't know they were uh, on-call. So there was a wide spectrum, and the handbook was way way to uh, um, codify, like, you know, what, what are the responsibilities as an on-call engineer? Um, how soon should they acknowledge the, the an alert and how soon should they get on the bridge? And uh, when should they uh, request a bridge? And and then um, more importantly, like, you know, what is the universe of alerts that the on-call engineer is uh, should expect? And uh, and what, what should they do when some of those alerts uh, go off? And then <clears throat> Uh, who are the dependent teams? Uh, how can they contact them? Uh, some of the resources for that, so that like you know whatever um, support the engineer, the on-call engineer needs, they have it um, uh, on hand. And from the threat modeling exercise, we had uh, identified a huge uh, area of like you know missing alerts, and the handbook also um, tracked the work that was needed to. Um, Add add those alerts, and so uh, and so the on-call responsibilities we kind of like saw them as uh, some work that has to be done uh, proactively uh, to add these missing alerts, and I'll talk about like tuning the alerts, and then some work that has to be done uh, reactively. So I'm going to go a little bit faster because I think we are uh, behind than I was expecting. Okay, so and then we also had uh, this concept of primary and secondary on-call. Um, secondary in our case would be somebody who was on call once that they, uh, they would transition after be becoming the secondary and then a new person would become the primary on call this provided like an additional support um uh for the the person and we also in some cases the teams were too small uh, like it felt like a four member team and we didn't want people to be on call uh, once a month we would combine the on call with uh, some other teams so that we could spread it out so that everybody was people who were going on call once uh, every uh, three months or so and as as uh, so that we think we could stretch it out um and then with uh, the 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 process aspect of it there was a lot of work we had to do to uh, close the feedback loops so one was uh, between the on call handoffs uh, we had a handoff meeting this uh, reiterated the fact that somebody was going on call and the previous uh, uh, person who was on call uh, primary on call can try share information about like you know what what are the incidents that happened what uh, if they changed any alert settings and uh, then um, things that are just like pertinent for the person joining uh, who's taking on the responsibility uh, in some cases we combined this meeting with uh, the dependent teams so it become it became uh, relevant for others as well and it became as a uh, a, a good uh, um water cooler conversation for like and everyone else to kind of catch up on like what is happening. And after every incident, we would track uh, the timelines. Um, if an uh, incident happened, like, you know, when did the failure, when was the failure introduced? Uh, when did the first alert go off? When was it acknowledged? And uh, when did we get the system back online? And uh, especially early on, like, you know, we would see that a lot of the alerts were uh, firing like you know later than what we would have expected so we started tuning the alerts based on that information and so that really helped us uh, get our alerts uh, 
um by within like a few months like you know our uh, alerts would always consistently be the first alerts to be received whenever we had a uh, company wide outages like you know we uh, our, our alerts would always be the first ones to go off Uh, and then we would notify stakeholders when something went wrong this was a way to like build trust um and uh, so instead of the stakeholders telling us hey i heard um, i'm getting reports that uh, something is wrong we would first notify them and say hey uh, we know there is a problem we're working on it and we would send a notification before and after the issue um and when we send a notification after the issue was fixed we would say like you know what happened how many customers were affected and uh, what are we going to do to uh, uh, prevent this from happening again so again some of this might be uh, uh, familiar to people following all the best practices <clears throat> and uh, the and it was important to whenever we got a false alert or like in whenever we would consistently get false alerts we invested the uh, uh, <clears throat> time and effort into reducing the uh, <clears throat> um, the 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 amount of false alerts we got and i think this was super critical and it eventually helped us like get really confident in our alerts uh, because early on we would get a lot of false alerts and the response would be to just like tune them out but once we started to uh, um tune them uh, like we would use uh, more like dynamic thresholds um, so instead of just saying like you know if our error rate is more than x percentage we would say we would look at okay if error rate is increasing by 50% in 5 minutes i don't remember the exact values we used um, something like that or if the response uh, time is going down by uh, dramatically over a short window then we want to uh, pay attention so we the depending on the uh, alert uh, system you use uh, you, you you're going to have a lot of uh, knobs to use dynamic values and those i felt were like more uh, useful in tuning our alerts and we also did a lot of uh, testing with the alerts uh, we would test them on, as a low priority alert that wouldn't generate a notification for few days or like weeks to get confident okay this alert seems to uh, work and we would sometimes even like try them in, in a lower environment and then like you know see uh, to to break the system and see if it's actually firing the alert and then then we would uh, use it as a higher priority alert uh, <clears throat> then the infrastructure piece um there is uh, something that's commonly referred to in the industry as like three pillars of observability uh, metrics uh, logs and traces um, we i i don't think you we you, know, you need to use uh, all three uh, i personally found out like, i started um, using logs initially for everything and uh, then once we started to use metrics i realized that like you know metrics are actually more uh, useful not that logs are not useful but uh, and uh, we we try to use uh, set up eager uh, as a distributed tracing system and uh, it, uh, it it didn't it, it it didn't work the way i was expecting and i think eventually i felt like just metrics between metrics and logs we pretty much got all the information uh, that that we uh, needed and i think it's it, the, the most important thing is to get the data that the team needs to uh, to to support the business transactions that they need um so in in general like some tips about like what I, what i had learned uh, using these tools um for in order to track things at an aggregate level i think metrics are in general like you know better um so to use a system like uh, prometheus uh, uh, it's it's better to track things at an aggregate level we for a while i had used uh, logs so I, i would we would use like log based systems and aggregate the logs uh, to track uh, things and which works it's just like more uh data intensive and uh, to always like go from structured data to unstructured data back to structured data is always more uh, uh, it's more intensive and uh, across all the business transactions and uh, like all the systems we want to track uh, latency errors and uh, uh, traffic and saturations those are considered like the golden signals and uh, if we know if we have like a view of those and we can be confident that uh, things are working as expected um and uh, and i think we we started like labeling some of the data points so we would know uh, so that we can answer questions like are are us customers having problems or european customers having problems or customers in china having problems and we can keep adding these labels uh, for products and different things and this is what's called like cardinality and this is this then it gets allows us to uh, like you know track more like service degradation rather than uh, whether things are just like up and down um 
for it i and then um, we started to use gain like a lot of value from using synthetic monitoring because uh, we had a lot of uh, business transactions that <clears throat> wouldn't get like a continuous traffic so it's not we couldn't rely on just users using the website to always know if things were up, up or down so like for example at mi- at uh, midnight um, there are very few energy customers who would uh, do certain like you know who would place orders at uh, 3 a.m. pacific time so we needed uh, synthetic monitoring to ensure that like you know the systems were still uh, up and running and, uh, and then the synthetic monitorings we can run we can just use them as a basic polling we could run like selenium scripts so there is like a whole gamut we'll be happy to talk about those um, and that 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 really gave us confidence that system was uh, working and then for what should be in a good alert uh, i would say like the the alert has to help the on call engineer uh, find the change that caused the alert in the first place uh, so i think that's the most uh, that's the purpose of the alert and we should monitor business transactions from a user standpoint uh, it's okay to do it's, it's okay to monitor like uh, resources directly but i think uh, monitoring from business standpoint is very critical and uh, um, yeah and then just like use percentiles uh, to so to so you're filtering out extreme values that also further reduces the uh, um, noise coming out of alerts um and then there are a few other elements of observability like you need a good uh, on call management tool um, most people might be using this already but and then um it's uh, for people who have a lot of uh, ui um ui performance is important uh, real user monitoring would be helpful where you monitor performance of your ui as the user experiences it and uh, and then uh, error tracking can also be a good uh, way to alleviate the load on the log monitoring tool uh, which ends up being super expensive and so once we had gone through this transformation um like you know we we built a culture that was uh, uh tipping small changes and testing them and measure and measuring them to gain confidence and we had uh, like system telemetry data to prove uh, our system uptime and uh, we had a better um, um alert uh, like in you know, a signal to noise ratio in our alerts and our uh, on call engineers were like better trained and so um yeah so that was uh, our um transition My name is Christopher Richards. Um, I am the founder for Relate Technologies. We're a uh, product consulting firm that works with a number, numerous different startups and enterprise businesses uh, with their product development. So we assist with uh, some of the uh, uh, feature development, building new applications, uh, building new products, and introducing them into their uh, respective markets, uh, or, or maybe helping an existing enterprise build. uh so uh, uh something existing or build on top right so uh our 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 main focus in love is products and so uh, what you'll be what what this is really what this presentation be based off of is our our love of products right and how to make better products that in turn make better businesses so real quick what I'll do is talk about today's agenda so in today's webinar we're going to talk about what is digital excellence in general um and in in that framework and and give you some pointers about that we'll talk about the four pillars of digital excellence and what's important to focus on to make digital transformation possible in your enterprise uh we'll talk about what the impact of digital excellence is uh for your organization or your teams um we'll, we'll talk about also how to use the canvas um to assess your standings and sort of look at your performance and see where you can provide solutions and then just some real time um knowledge about how you can apply this to whatever venture you're doing today whether you're just starting off with building your first cool app or uh, you've already got something in the market you've got an MVP and now you're looking to acquire a new new business and 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 new customer bases so this is I'll go straight into here so what makes me so important to talk about this right in terms of digital excellence and enterprises so um in terms of my background like i said earlier i run the product consulting firm but before then i used to run another startup for about 4 years uh called prisma systems 
Um, and uh, we, we built a product around automated product photography. So uh, we would have uh, retailers like Target, they would send us products to our warehouses. And uh, we had automation, uh, automated robots that would help us take uh, 360s and photos of uh, those product images. And then we would upload all those assets to whatever their e-commerce store is, right? So if you can imagine, we, you know, you sent us a water bottle, um, we would capture all the little assets about it. And um, you would have uh, great looking e-commerce images that will help con uh, convert users on your platform. So uh, ran that business for about four years and had a successful exit about in, in, in 2019. Um, so, you know, during my stint, um, you know, I had a, I was more or less the product CEO, had my product hat on and, uh, you know, also, you know, uh, participated in things with fundraising, uh, managing cross-functional teams, um, uh, uh, doing product releases into the market, and then um, also sort of analyzing what the market is doing or saying about my product and, and, um, and sort of taking it from there. Um, I'm also a former IT manager and uh, I've done some, some work for Harvard, uh, uh, working with their crowd innovation lab. So, um, you know, it, it, at my core, I'm a developer, uh, but I, I really do like trying to put things in layman terms to people so they can understand uh, where tech is coming from and making it so where tech isn't as complex. So, um, you know, the big question that most people have uh, nowadays is, you know, with the increased complexity of tech and all the products and services that are coming out, how do some of the best leaders create and manage digital enterprises? And this was a, a big question that I, I asked myself and um, I started to, uh, you know, book meetings with individuals um, in leadership positions in these tech companies and start to understand, um, you know, how their processes work, how they go about building enterprises and um, what, what, can, what can people do to get there, right? Um, a, a lot of the times in the startup world, we, we don't know what we don't know. So um, a, a lot of what you see here today is a culmination of research that I've done um, on my end and then in collaboration with other profession, tech professionals in the field. Um, so how do you build this? How do you build, how do you build successful digital frameworks? Or I'm sorry, uh, digital enterprises. And you know, most people they'll try to look for some type of software tool, methodology, or some type of uh, mystical guru strategy. But in real, in reality, it's a framework, right? A framework is a set of actions and things that um, you apply against, and you, you know you're constantly refining and and making sure that it achieves your end. So, um, in this framework, we call it the digital excellence framework, right? So imagine you had a framework that helps you gain competitive edge in the market and help you implement those innovative business models, right? You keep your stakeholders accountable for all the digital efforts that you're doing and involved with all the uh, constant change, um, providing a standard for which people can reach those digital goals, and then ultimately breeding an environment of digital success, right? So if everyone um, from the top of, of management to you know, the bottom of the core teams um, is on board with the digital strategy, um, it makes for a, a much more uh, beneficial uh, framework and, and performance for your organization when it comes to technical comp competency. So the digital excellence framework is what we're going to go into today and what we're going to uncover um, in, in terms of how I can build the best digital enterprises and then what are the things that I need to be looking at and focusing on to, to make my enterprise better and compete, right, in this rapidly changing digital economy. So what I like to do is kind of bring it back to home a little bit. Uh, to kind of give you a real world example. So, um, you know, it, I, it's funny, more more use 2020. I think we're all going back to 2020 because it 
it definitely it, it iterated um, some major changes in our world that needed to happen, right? But uh, for Pfizer, you know, the, the COVID vaccine um, pharmaceutical company, they've been working on digitization and digital transformation for their business for the last 10 years. So when they first started, none of their manufacturing sites were connected. They didn't have any type of data sharing. It's all types of legacy systems. And it was ultimately pretty hard to, to collaborate um, um, operations-wise. Um, so uh, fast forward today, they've completely revamped everything in, in inside of their internal operations. So, you know, they have complete supply chain visibility and each of their manufacturing sites is now this data-driven uh, engine, if you will, uh, that's you know constantly looking at information and uh, providing the best in terms of their output and their quality. So uh, because this, this rapid transformation of Pfizer, uh, we were a, we, uh, from a study we found, we actually found that they helped credit it with 3 million um, new doses for the vaccines originally um, planned, uh, I think when they did their original um, contract with the government. So there are some benefits to digital transformation. Pfizer is only, uh, only one example, uh, but uh, another one is, is also Lego. Uh, before the 2000, 2010 or so, Le uh, Lego uh, was in a very similar state, right? All their manufacturing sites, uh, weren't connected, and they they didn't use digital technology as they do today. Um, so, you know, if you were to go into these business now versus you know ten years ago, you would see how things have completely changed and revamped um, the way they work and how they collaborate. So, to digital transformation is what drives business innovation. So, in in order to have those increased profits, to uh, have better operational efficiency, and, and build a better uh, business, um, there's 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 sort of like a four step process that we see organizations go through in order to achieve that digital transformation. So, the first thing that they do is an assessment of their digital excellence maturity. So through a couple of different key areas to look at where they're good at, where they're not good at, and then doing a sort of an assessment there. Um, two, they'll go ahead and, and sort of craft a shared vision and roadmap with stakeholders, right? So this really starts, is really a top, a, a top down approach when it comes to digital excellence. You know, you should have a, you should have a leadership suite that uh, encourages these types of a transformation and a large change, uh, because otherwise um, it'd be hard to drive the conversation uh, or even the initiatives if there's no buy-in, right? So a lot of it is crafting a shared vision and what are the outcomes that everyone wants to see from building a better digital business. Uh, three is, is going into implementing those roadmaps, strategies, and initiatives. Once you've set the shared vision and roadmap, um, it, it takes some time to Im implement certain initiatives, but uh, once those initiatives are met across the board and all the key areas, um, it, it, it truly does enable their business to really start reaping the digital benefits. And then four, like um, after you've executed on everything and they analyze and optimize and look at their performance on time. So this is the very uh, simplistic four-step method of how, how, how things go uh, in terms of the cycle, but um, we'll sort of do a little bit more of a deep dive of how we do that assessment, how might we craft a shared vision, and then what does it mean to really help implement those roadmaps and analyze, right? So digital transformation in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, changing your business and how it operates and what are, what are your value propositions uh, requires focus in, in four key areas. And we like to call these the four pillars of digital excellence. Um, so four pillars of digital excellence we'll, we'll reveal here now. So the first pillar that's super important in terms of breeding digital success is unique digital experiences. So this is how you interact with the customer, how you service the customer, um, how you uh, handle you know, your internal operations, though uh, 
having having initiatives in in the digital experiences part ultimately help bring your business uh, into that digital first uh, 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 mindset, right? The second one is having on-demand digital capabilities. So uh, being able to have the uh, correct uh, people put in place to achieve certain uh, objectives, architecture um, to handle, let's say, an, an influx of load, right? Um, you know, if Elon Musk tweets out your product, you better be sure you're ready to take on that 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 load, right? Um, so, and then the other the other two uh, pillars are transformative leadership, uh, what I talked about earlier, where um, these leaders aren't just looking for incremental change; they're looking for large, uh, impactful change that ultimately drives success of their business, and then operational efficiency. So being able to take the data that you learn in the digital age and use it for your your own your own gain. Um, so from there, we could th these pillars are what breed digital success. And as long as as long as most enterprises have an initiative in the in these pillars, um, then they will they will start breeding that success. So what I like to do is 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 deep dive into each pillar, if if you will, quickly about what what each one takes and and what's its focus, right? Because you need digital experiences sort of broad. So the biggest question you want to ask yourself in terms of unique digital experiences you're providing for your company is in what ways you're offering provide that enticing rich experience. So this could be uh, on the web. This could be on mobile. Uh, how, are, how are you doing things digitally? So within, the, within that initial first pillar, you have the digital customer focus, right? So, you know, have you identified the needs of your customers and how they're making purchase decisions? So did I, you know, was I scrolling on Instagram and then I saw um, an ad for your, for your, um, your thing and I, and I thought that looked cool and I made my decision. These are sort of pieces of the focus you would need to take a look at. Um, digital, digital value, how is your, how is your offering, um, how, how's your offering being uh, received to customers by using digital technology? What improvement does that do? Um, let's say you're a traditional accounting firm and now you want to digitize everything, you know, that has a lot of, of a good digital value in of itself as you can reduce the amount of overhead your operation has to do. And then, you know, customers can you come in and maybe log into their own account and, and see their own numbers, right? Uh, so those things, digital value make a whole lot of sense. The same thing with um, experience analysis. We want to measure the customer's experience use those findings and use that to increase our value proposition. So you're looking at everything, of you're just shadowing users, those sort of things. And then social impact and analysis, that's a huge part. Um, how people are behaving when they're using your product, communicating to your, your audiences, uh, what the impact of what you're doing is and um, ultimately keeping a, a, a finger on the pulse, if you will, of whatever your market case. So now that we've talked about unique digital experiences pillar, let's dive into the next pillar, which is on-demand digital capabilities. So the idea here is if you got 10x the traffic, will your systems, uh, people, uh, in, in other uh, pieces of your operation, will they be able to meet that demand, right? So the biggest things with on-demand digital capabilities is the technical competency. Do you have the right people that have the knowledge and resources to meet uh, the solutions you're wanting to build? Cybersecurity is a big part of it as well. Uh, being able to have that expertise and establish security on the new digital systems. Um, just like deploying any new digital system in the in the in the, in the in the atmosphere definitely uh, breeds its own security risk if not to vet it correctly. So that that's always a concern. Um, there's talent act, uh, talent attraction and retention. That's a huge one, right? Uh, being able to being able to get high quality talent and retain them. You know, it's uh, it's pretty hard enough for a lot of tech companies to find the right talent nowadays. 
Um, but it, for companies that focus on talent attraction, um, this, this ultimately helps them in this pillar um, if they could solve that problem. And then the last one is just that data and analytics edge, right? So are you being able to look at big data and analytics to drive your decision-making? And that's where on-demand digital capabilities come into play. So um, with, the, with this pillar in mind, um, a, lot, a lot of the digital efforts and initiatives still rely on people, right? People are still what drive uh, systems and processes. So this is where transformative leadership is truly a, an important pillar in terms of how do I bring digital transformation to my organization. So uh, from the top down, you know, executives should be thinking about their clear strategic vision and targets. So typically, what I've seen in businesses is uh, you'll have a, some type of chief digital officer. Uh, they'll uh, work with other uh, chief executives in the business to uh, meet certain meet their digital strategy uh, and lay out goals that are clear and measured. Right, so you want to do sort of the same thing, um, and with by by having that, um, you ultimately remove any sort of um, misconception about what you're doing and. Um, Every, everyone's aligned, right? So team agility and environment is pretty important as well. If the leadership isn't supporting that, that type of change and uh, agile ability in, the, in their, your environment, then it, it definitely uh, impedes how well you perform in this particular pillar. And then the last two are more or less uh, the leadership uh, culture that's involved. So are you guys open for change? And are people motivated, right, to, to, to make these changes? Uh, because a lot of people, they'll, they'll, they'll get stuck uh, seeing the forest through the trees. They don't see the forest through the trees of the bigger picture, right? So um, it's important to help them see exactly where you're coming from. And then on performance and growth insights, there's just tools and methods and how, what to put in place uh, to learn about how you're performing in the market, which will then turn you tell you how to grow, right? So the last piece that will, the last pillar that, um, you know, we've touched on quite a bit a little bit, but um, the operational efficiency part of things just really come, boils down to, are you using data to inform your decision? And then how are you measuring and improving your performances? So a lot of businesses nowadays, They'll use uh, to start to automate certain processes and start to digitize things that'll help them have higher performance and efficiency. They'll have digital collaboration. So tools like Slack and uh, Teams and uh, Jira and Figma, all of those are huge in helping with knowledge diffusion, accountability, and so forth. And then, um, you know, lean continuous improvement is helping get rid of all the waste in your organization, right? And you try to keep things lean uh, and also try to reduce the cost and time efficiencies with, operation, uh, with operations. So that just about covers all of the, the main pillars. Um, and uh, you'll, you guys will have access to this, uh, to this presentation after this call. Um, so if there's anything that I might've went over a little faster, um, you can feel free to go back and revisit and or even ask questions. I'm happy to, to elaborate on some of these terms. Um, so now that we've got the four pillars in, in place and uh, we've identified the key areas. So what you might ask, you might ask me, Chris, why, do, why, do, why use a digital excellence framework? What, what does it even matter? Why can I just continue to operate as I'm doing? Well, if you don't have a unified digital transformation strategy for your business, you could be missing out on a numerous different benefits. And for this one, I'd like to go over a couple of different impacts that we've seen from organizations as a result of doing this. So digital transformation is at the forefront of every organization today. Um, so some very interesting facts that we found today that even impressed me um, 
I'll, I'll kind of share a few of them. So 70% of organizations either have a digital transformation strategy or they're currently working on one. So, and, and, this, was, and this was done on a survey on a global level um, with a number of different IT professionals and enterprises. Um, and we had a couple different research sources if you're interested in that as well. Um, so 70% of organizations, they have a strategy. Another big thing that I didn't know is you know, 50%, 56% of these CEOs have said that these have already improved profits. So we're starting to see increasing buy-in of leadership roles uh, for digital transformation and what it can do for their businesses. Um, likewise, with marketing, it, 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 we're starting to see an upward trend of people to use digital transformation to drive their growth, right? Um, everyone wants to be uh, social media savvy, uh, but not everyone has a digital strategy of how to go about uh, taking on their social media spheres and, and, and having that social influence. So that's where digital transformation comes in to where you can learn about the users that are using these social media platforms. You can figure out what their likes and dislikes are and, and craft a better strategy that way. And then, so we're starting to see this real clear trend for organizations that, that want to complete globally in Excel, that transformation is usually at the forefront. Um, and even in my experience uh, working um, in, in other startup businesses, um, uh, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the solutions that we pitch to enterprise businesses are purely because we're helping them automate something that they haven't done before. We're helping them save cost savings where they haven't before, uh, or time. Right? These are pretty big, huge values that if you can adequately sell the upper management on, um, would uh, have some clear benefits for you. So, and it's not just the organization that has these impacts. Let's talk about a little bit about the impact of what this means for employees themselves by doing digital transformation. So as you guys know, like remote work is here to stay. I think a lot of individuals up to this point of time have understood that uh, remote work is, is, is a natural progression of, of our digital age, right? So by doing digital excellence and having a, a digital transformation strategy, you can facilitate global distributed teams without having a bunch of overhead, right? Um, and some real interesting facts that I've learned as a, as a result of looking at digital transformation is, you know, typically workers that have technologies that support them are 230% more engaged for what they're doing. Um, experts that experts predict generally that 60% of companies will switch to hybrid in 2022. Now we'll have to revisit that number because it's 2023 now. We'll see if that if that if that um, holds true. Um, but ultimately, we do see this large shift. Most businesses and roles are doing that hybrid approach. And then, you know, workplaces that have that online digital collaboration and support, they see their productivity improve by about 30% or so. So the having this framework uh, for digital transformation, it ultimately will help you keep the teams focused, engaged, and accountable with the initiatives. And you'll see, they'll start to see benefits in how they work together. And um, this could ultimately translate to uh, pure output for your organization. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people could do a lot more with 30% productivity increase. Um, so the impact for teams is huge. So you might ask yourself, okay, great. Now I'll learn about the canvas uh, or learn about digital excellence. How do, what is the canvas? How do I use it? And where do I start, right? So we've concepted the digital excellence canvas is to be sort of a, uh, uh, an initial uh, exercise that you can perform with uh, stakeholders in your business. So the canvas is just a, a sort of in its basic form right now is a worksheet that you can uh, facilitate with those individuals and um, ultimately supposed to help you drive the conversation for digitization. Um, so, so really 
you know, how do you get started with digital transformation? If this is something that you're interested in for your business, it's really just start with the intent and share desired outcomes to, to jumpstart the conversation. Um, because sometimes um, for people to understand why we're, uh, st- what we're doing or uh, why it's important, um, you should, they should understand what the intent is and then what are the outcomes for doing so, right? So for a lot of businesses, Let's improve our product experience across the board, right? And what does doing that do? Well, it may increase our market share. Uh, we may gain new customers. We could see additional uh, profits in, in, in our future. Um, and these are things that enable buy-in, right? Um, so uh, that's that's sort of the, the main challenge is making sure that we have buy-in and we do that with intent and shared outcomes. So the DE Canvas, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of I'll, I'll give some references to the sheet and you'll be able to download and use the Canvas yourself at any point. But, um, you know, the Canvas itself, you, you really measure, you measure digital excellence in, in certain time sprints. So it's not a, it's not a, you know, plan it once and forget about it and never look at it again. This is, this is a framework, right? So you constantly need to be looking at uh, how you're doing things and, and readjust. So for the digital excellence canvas itself, typically what you'd like to do is uh, pick one initiative for each pillar. Uh, for all the four pillars that I talked about, uh, you at least want to have one initiative for each one. And so you might do this uh, planning meeting uh, annually with owners or executives of the business. Um, so uh, if you're getting that uh, initial top top management buy-in, this is where you can come in to, and um, talk to them about what they want to do to digitally transform their businesses and then how you can reach certain outcomes, right? And then uh, to break that down even more, um, you would quarterly align those digital goals with whatever yearly efforts you had uh, met uh, had done originally with your executives. And then, and then breaking that down a little bit more, you do that on a monthly basis with your core teams, right? So all the, all the individuals that are contributing to building your, your uh, digital excellence initiatives, uh, whatever the case may be, it might be over, overhauling a certain uh, subsection of your business or whatever the case, right? So uh, that's what, so you can do it annually, quarterly, and monthly. And these are generally what we found to be the best frequency uh, for, for doing the canvas. So let's talk about the canvas itself and give you guys an idea of what this looks like. So um, the canvas itself, uh, it, it's a worksheet. It's got some, uh, first it's got a dis- kind of descriptor around the canvas and how to use it. But what you see in front of you right here is the first worksheet, right? And uh, the first worksheet or, or part of the worksheet, I guess, is uh, uh, just an assessment overall of, of the four, four pillars. So what you want to do is, you know, start listing those main initiatives. So initiatives that you've, you've started pursuing or ones that um, uh, you, you haven't yet but intend to. Uh, so this is where you sort of just lay it out all on paper get a good idea of, of where your standings are. And if you haven't thought about what you're doing for each pillar, this is a great area for you to, to, to do to sit there and, and brainstorm uh, ways to make your business better through digital, through some digital means. So once you once you've got once you've done the let me go back here. So once you've done the original four pillars and done the high level um, initiatives, um, you can then the second sheet worksheet after that is sort of a breakdown of each pillar that contains all of the key areas which we talked about earlier. So you would use those key areas to uh, further break down what those high level initiatives are into 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 uh, action items that make sense for your business. So, you know, if digital customer focus is something that you guys want to focus on, um, you start to lay down what initiatives can you do in that key area to help? Um, and then of this pillar, what are the priorities and solutions that we can provide uh, in order to, 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 to get to the next step, right? So uh, the idea is you have initiatives, 
things that you're currently implementing or ongoing, priority, um, you know, one being the lowest, five being the highest, and where do you want to focus for transformation? And then solutions, that's where you really start having the conversations with your team in order to build a better, better uh, digital strategy. So, you okay, this is great, Chris. I love it. How do I get the framework, right? Uh, so uh, you can scan this QR code here to get uh, free access to the PDF. So this resource is yours to use for any of your needs. Um, you, so you can use this. You can just do a little bit of a brainstorming session or, you know, introduce this to any of your other uh, venture partners as you're um, doing your planning meeting for the year. And, um, you know, if digital transformation is a big focus of yours, this is where this really comes in handy and helping facilitate that conversation. So you can go to digicanvas.myrelaytech.com to get a free download that way. Or if you haven't already, you can scan this QR code. It'll just take a quick second. Um, but if not, we're gonna move ahead. So, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll kind of talk about uh, how do we use this in real time um, and um, sort of see it, see about closing here. So, you know, using a canvas in real time, it, it really boils down to those four main steps. And the reason is we wanted to make this as easy as possible for people to reiterate on. Um, and so the biggest part is the assessment with the team, right? And using the canvas to help guide the conversations. Um, sometimes half of the battle is knowing exactly what to do and, and how to do it. And so ideally the canvas should help you uh, start those conversations in a meaningful way, and then um, provide some focus on some areas where you didn't know where to focus at originally, right? So that, 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 that's the big, the big thing is doing the assessment and knowing where you're at. After you've done the assessment, then that's when you can craft the shared objectives, outcomes, and commitments. So um, this is a this is definitely more of a, pe a people exercise where you may have to talk to you know chiefs, your your head of product, or you may have to talk to some of your uh, IT folks about uh, this digital transformation strategy. Try to get their idea of what they would want to see out of that transformation strategy and and outcomes, and then providing commitments uh, to each other. Because if you're going to do this. Uh, having commitments, uh, interdepartment inter commitments to each other may, uh, is going to uh, help keep everyone accountable, right? Um, and then the third one is, and the, and the most important one is just to execute. You know, uh, get something down on paper, start executing on those initiatives, and continue to strive. The big thing to know for 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 digital excellence is it, it's not a it's not a silver bullet for everything. It does take time, um, but uh, if you do have the right intent and you have constant applied effort, uh, digital excellence is worth th its benefits in gold. Um, and um, I'll show you a couple benefits after this. And then lastly, just measuring your performance, reassessing what what your of what your business and enterprise is doing, and then optimizing that over time. So I love to talk about some of the challenges with digital excellence because digitization is, is, a, is a tall order. Some organizations are, are you know, miles behind, if not years before they even consider some of these, some of these tactics. But um, just a few, a few challenges include, you know, limited competency in one area, um, if you know you're a finance firm and you have nothing to do with IT and you don't have anybody on your IT team, that definitely affects your ability to execute, right? Um, continuous change can be um, a, a challenge, especially if you uh, have an enterprise that's a little bit more resistant to change. Um, and if that change is not communicated in an effective way, it could definitely be detrimental to your digital transformation efforts. Um, some other big ones uh, for sure are resistance from employees and management. Uh, again, to kind of coming back to, you, you, will, you will encounter some people that are like, okay, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, in this case, 
you just need to recircle back to the why. Why are we doing this? It, it, um, and what are the outcomes that they're going to get out of doing, you know, uh, whatever the tr transformation is? And then uh, research barriers uh, to, pro to research to product barriers sometimes is an issue, right? Uh, you may you may measure, you may think you're measuring a, a enough information from a particular uh, user group to make a make an assumption and you know build some type of product, but um, ultimately you may be missing information. Uh, you may not know how to translate those things directly. So. Um, these are just a number of challenges that we've seen uh, the businesses that undertake digital transformation. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the benefits far exceed the, the, the challenges that one would encounter um, by over 10x. And, and these, are, these are quantifiable by the industry today um, in terms of, you know, how many companies that have done trans this, these transformations I've done in terms of market share, profits, um, you know, how they're engaging with their communities and um, their products in general. So the big question, right, is why? Why even focus on digital excellence? And why is it important to our industry today? Well, on demand is now such a huge consumer expectation. Um, and we live in this sort of now economy. So um, having a good digital excellence strategy um, definitely prepares you for handling the worst, right? In, in terms of operational load. And then um, ultimately um, increasing your value propositions for the customer, right? If they know they could uh, come to your service at any time and point and, and perform something, that's a huge benefit, right? Uh, the second one is in the employees. Well, we're starting to use more of more tool, modern tools to increase our effectiveness in the field. Um, so, you know, automation is starting to take over a lot of different aspects of our business. And we're even seeing this with chat GPT now today, uh, where um, I just read a story that was like uh, someone just gave the chat GPT a, a MBA exam. And they were able to do uh, everything you know normal MBA would do. Um, so um, we don't we don't want tech that replaces people, but rather we want to uh, empower people to with tech, right, to do the best they can. Um, and then other three are mostly you know strengthening 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 your market share and experiences with customers, uh, being entirely data driven to drive that decision drive decisions faster and minimize your risks. And then, you know, improving the agility, innovation and culture of your business. So these are, these are really the main benefits of why you wanna do that. And, you know, if you're just starting out, um, you wanna, you really wanna start building digital first and top of mind. Uh, that way, as you grow, you can uh, readjust and, you um, uh, craft your strategy to, to match your growth, right? Because uh, it will change depending on the needs of your business. So, you know, in, in my experience, the, the digital transformation wave is already here, right? Uh, for some people, you know, it's a matter of will you sink or will you swim? And so uh, that's, that's ultimately what uh, everything that I had on terms of the agenda today,